Hi there, Andy here. So let's talk about some radio radioactive decay. So on the MCAT, you could get questions about the types of radioactive decay. The first thing you should know is that it always involves protons and neutrons not has nothing to do with electrons because the protons and neutrons are in the nucleus they're you know they're nucleons and they have strong nuclear forces strong nuclear forces um, that you know kind of determine uh, what type of decay you'll have specifically it's the ratio so ratio of neutrons to protons and so any changes in radio in radioactive decay uh, are going to be you know mainly a result of changing the, the neutrons and the protons. Um, okay, so let's talk specifically about the types of decay. Firstly, we have alpha decay, and this is very similar to a helium atom. And this is going to be shown as 4, 2, alpha. So when you have an atom, uh, let's pick a good example of uranium. Let's do uranium and 92 and 238. Let's say it decays into something, we don't know, x and an alpha. You basically just subtract this because you know, both sides have to be equal. So if you subtract 4 from 238, you'll get 234, and then 2 from 92, 90. And so this unknown element x is going to have 90 protons, and that means it's going to be thorium. Thorium. By the way, look up thorium. That's supposed to be the future of nuclear energy. But that's far beyond what we're talking about in the MCAT. But you see, the idea is that it's going to decay, shoot off a helium or an alpha particle with a 4 and a 2, and you just make sure that both sides add up. Now, we could have added some sort of coefficient here, and in that case, you would do 4 times 3 is 12, so it's 238 minus 12, which would be to 26, and then 3 times 2 is 6, and so instead of this it would be 92 minus 6, which would be 84, and in that case, instead of thorium, you'd get polonium. you get polonium. So just be sure to watch your coefficients and make sure that both sides balance. Okay, so that was alpha decay. Let's talk about the two types of beta decay. Two types of beta decay. And what are these two types? We have beta negative and beta positive. And these are shown by um, simply negative beta and positive beta. Now, sometimes these can also be shown as electrons, uh, but usually you should get the beta form. And so same idea as with alpha, just make sure that both sides equal each other and you should be fine. So, uh, just a little side note that I start in my notes is that when this is on reactance, reactance side, it's called an electron capture. So keep that in mind if they use that terminology on you. And then we have one more type of radioactive decay. It's called gamma decay. And so this type of decay isn't actually a particle, 
but it's energy. It's showed by gamma, the y, and it's just energy. So a possible pro problem you could get is that with the other types of decay, those particles can be affected by, you know, magnetic fields or other things, so affected by magnetism, the alpha and beta decays. But gamma decay, since it's not really a particle, it's just energy, it's not affected by magnetism. So keep that in mind. And so when you have, uh, let's use an example, when you have a gamma decay, we will look at iodine, radioactive iodine. When you have gamma decay, like this, you don't change any of the superscripts or subscripts, they stay the same, and you just have energy. So sometimes this will be shown as an activated radioactive iodine, which means that, that it loses it and it gives off energy. So keep these uh, types of decay in mind. Now let's quickly talk about Half-Life. Not the game. Half-Life um, is something that I think some students struggle with, but it's really a simple concept that if you get a question on the MCAT, you will be able to answer it pretty quickly. So what is a half-life? Half-life is the amount of time it takes for half of the original substance to decay. Let's go a little down. So, what does that mean? Well, let's use an example. A uh, blue example. So let's say I have um, 1200 micromoles of activated radioactive iodine, which has a half-life, HL, of 8 days. How long till I have only uh, 250 micromoles? For me, I find it easy just to, you know, there's there are possible equations you can use to solve this, but I just find it easier to write it out um, as it goes along. So I have T, and I have the amount, and I'll say, I'll make a little chart, I'll say, at T days, there's 1,200 micromoles. At 8 days, so that's one half-life, right? One half-life. We're going to have 600. At 16 days, we're going to have 300, so we're just adding half-lives. At 24 days, so that's another half-life, because each half-life is 8 days, we're going to have half of 300, so 150. So if you notice here, this happens a lot on the MCAS, that you have to approximate. Now we don't know exactly when we'll only have 250 micromolars left, but we know that it's somewhere in between in between 16 and 24 days. So our time is somewhere between 16 and 24. Now the MCAT is is a nice exam in that Usually when you have number problems, you know, dealing with stuff like this, the answers are pretty evenly dispersed. So for example, we might see answers, you know, A will be you know, 5 days, B will be 20 days, C will be, you know, 32 days, I'm just making these numbers up, and D will be uh, 45 days. And, you know, they, they space out their answers a lot so that you can approximate because you're not allowed to use a calculator. So in this case, we know that T is between 16 and 24, and the only answer that would fit this would be B. And so the MCAT would present a question like this where you can do kind of this this very basic yet quick, um, you know, walkthrough of the problem and approximate your answer and get the correct answer. So be aware that you'll get some half-life problems, but understanding the idea behind it and how to quickly calculate it while approximating will uh, get you the most points. So keep in mind half-life and the different types of radioactive decay.